Welcome to another lecture on planet Narnia. As always, if you prefer reading, I recommend this book and the chapter on Saturn, which I will popularize in this lecture. We have reached the very final book, the seventh volume of the Chronicles of Narnia, called The Last Battle, Battle and the planet associated with it, according to Michael Ward's theory, Saturn. C.S. Lewis, in his post-conversion disposition, didn't believe in a universe that was dominated by Saturn, didn't believe in a Saturn-centric universe, but he was ready to give Saturn his due. Essential to Lewis's theodicy, so essential to Lewis's answer to the problem of evil, was that only by acknowledging evil and sin and suffering could we arrive at the real center of the spiritual cosmos, which will be revealed at the end of this lecture. Let's start with Saturn in Lewis's poetry. In fact, Saturn was the subject of Lewis's first published poem called Quam Bene Saturno from 1913. So he was uh, barely 15 years old. This is the only positive Saturn, Saturn, Saturnine poem. The others are either neutral or negative. Quam bene Saturno was probably a school translation exercise. As I mentioned thereafter, the poems turned to Infortuna Maior, um, Saturn in its less uh, fulsome effects. Five examples of Saturnine poetry are Lines to Mr. Compton Mackenzie, which Ward calls negligible, The Turn of the Tide, Pindar sang on W.T. Kirkpatrick, and of course, The Planets. I recommend you hit pause, as always, and read the lines from the planets, the lines about Saturn, lines 111 to 122, before continuing. So hit pause now and, uh, and see you in a bit. So <clears throat> lines 7 to 10 are a recap of the six planets. Talk about fancy, fair language, love, light, Mars, Jove, which have all failed or they have all left us. <clears throat> Saturn is not per se, like none of the planets are. His melancholy drink is either for bane or blessing. The epigraph in the handout, which I've linked in the description, says, this is a quote from a discarded image, born under Saturn, you are qualified to become either a mope and a malcontent or a great contemplative. A mope and a malcontent or a great contemplative. Remember that. Let me read a bit more from the discarded image. This is from page 105. In the earth, his influence produces lead. In men, the melancholy complexion. In history, disastrous events. In Dante, his sphere is the heaven of contemplatives. He is connected with sickness and old age. Our traditional picture of Father Time with the scythe is derived from earlier pictures of Saturn. A good account of his activities in promoting fatal accidents, pestilence, treacheries, and ill luck in general 
occurs in The Knight's Tale. He's the most terrible of the seven and is sometimes called the greater in fortune, in fortuna mayor. Lewis uses planetary influences in his literary criticism, for example, Saturnine influences. John, poet, John Donne's poems give us, he says, a Saturn-centric universe, although Donne himself doesn't mention any of the planets. Saturn-centric here means a stern universe that is astringent, unmerry, tough uncomfortable, serious. As an undergraduate, Lewis himself was, he says, intoxicated with Dawn's poetry. And this intoxication lingered for long, for example, through his war experience. He would sympathize with heroic pessimism of other poets as well. And this pessimistic spirit is present in the young Lewis's uh, poetry collection, Spirits in Bondage, from 1921, so he would have been about 23 years old. However, he turns back on such poets and such dispositions from about early or mid-30s onward. The post-conversion Lewis focuses on not Saturn but Jupiter, in Surprised by Joy, Lewis says, the key to my books is Dawn's maxim. He, the heresies that men leave are hated most. The things I assert most rigorously, vigorously are those that I resisted long and accepted late. As Lewis turns back, uh, it turns his back on a Saturnine spirit of dawn, so does Jane Studdock um, in That Hideous Strength. She abandons her pro pro projected doctoral thesis on dawn after her encounter with Jovial Ransom to follow her vocation. Lewis is sometimes criticized of this as um, as being somehow adverse to female scholarship, which is very un untrue. Um, he would support a lot of female scholars, but that he has a different agenda here. It wasn't Jane Studdock's vocation, whereas it could be some other women's vocation. Saturn is not bad to cool fully. You remember there's the blessing as well as bane effects depending on one's character. Saturn also descends at the end of that hideous strength. Um, the means by which God of the story called Maleldil punishes the sinner are Saturnine. But Saturn is also the servant who provokes good qualities in the characters, like belief and potential possible belief and godly sorrow. Let me read from the book directly. Stir the fire, Deniston, for any sake. That's a cold night, said McPhee. It must be cold outside, said Dimble. All thought of that, of stiff grass, hen roosts, dark places in the middle of woods, graves. Then of the sun's dying, the earth gripped, suffocated, in airless cold, the black sky lit only with stars. And then not even stars, the heat death of the universe, utter and final blackness of non-entity from which nature knows no return. Another life? Possibly, thought McPhee. I believe, thought Denniston. 
But the old life gone, all its times, all its hours and days gone. Can even omnipotence bring back? Where do years go and why? Man never would understand it. The misgiving deepened. Perhaps there was nothing to be understood. Saturn, whose name in the heavens is Rurga, stood in the blue room. His spirit lay upon the house, or even on the whole earth, with a cold pressure, such as might flatten the very orb of Tellus to a wafer, matched against the lead-like burden of his antiquity, the other gods themselves perhaps felt young and ephemeral. It was a mountain of centuries sloping up from the highest antiquity we can conceive, up and up like a mountain whose summit never comes into sight, not eternity, not to eternity where the thought can rest, but into more and still more time, into freezing wastes and silence of unnameable numbers. It was also strong like a mountain. Its age was no mere morass of time where imagination can sink in reverie, but a living self-remembering duration which repelled lighter intelligences from its structure like granite flings back waves, itself unwithered and undecayed, but able to wither any who approach it unadvised. Ransom and Merlin suffered a sensation of unendurable cold, and all that was strength in Lurga became sorrow as it entered them. Belief, potential belief, and godly sorrow. Why godly? Well, because of its effects. It leads to joy, which is symbolized by the advent of Jupiter, who descends last. Sorrow comes, but Saturn doesn't have the last word. NICE, so National Institute of Coordinated Experiments, they suffer from the bane effects of, of Saturn, an ungodly sorrow. The characters shoot each other. One shoots herself. One is trampled to death. One is beheaded, stabbed. Another is mauled. One is burnt and one is buried alive. This center disintegrates internally. In Lewis's non-fictional writings, too, time and again, um, he emphasizes the brute fact of mortality of all species and of Earth. So he took Saturn very seriously. Although he focuses on the jovial side, um, he cannot be accused of naive optimism. By the way, here's another planetary analysis of Lewis, especially the Ransom trilogy called Planets in Peril by, you see, David C. Downing, one of the co-directors of the Wade Center today. I just got it in the mail. I haven't, in fact, read it yet, but I thought I'd mention it. Ward is not the only one interested in these themes. Mr. Andrew McPhee from the trilogy was based on William Kirkpatrick, Lewis's private tutor from the ages of 16 to 19. The poem on W.T. Kirkpatrick likens per, uh, Kirkpatrick to Father Time himself. And Kirkpatrick was Saturn in Lewis's personal mythology of his own life. For against Kirkpatrick's mind, uh, with noise of yeasty waves, flung the young spirit swellings of my uncorrected mind, says the poem. Like in that hideous strength, Saturn who repelled lighter intelligences from its structure as granite flings back waves. 
In Surprise by Joy, and this is quoted by Ward as well on Planet, in Planet Narnia, page 198, we read of Kirkpatrick, his was a Saturnine humor. Indeed, he was very like Saturn, not the dispossessed king of Italian legend, but grim old Kronos, father time himself with scythe and hourglass. The bitterest and also funniest things came out when he had risen abruptly from table, always before the rest of us, and stood ferreting in a villainous old tobacco jar on the mantelpiece for the dottles of former pipes, which it was his frugal habit to use again. My debt to him is very great, my reverence to this day undiminished. According to Ward, McPhee is the only naturally Saturnine character of the trilogy, and he is last seen studiously ignoring this carnal foreplay, foreplay happening all around him. As Ward says, it's an affectionately mocking portrait, as total seriousness would be more than serious Saturn deserves. Let's turn to the last battle and, as always, start with the imagery. Ward says that this book is a story of apocalyptic terror. The author kills off every character with whom the story opens. The bleakness of tone is, is created by using uh, several technical literary devices. For example, there's the quite delayed appearance of the narrator, and this would be quite disheartening for children. There's also heavy reliance on irony, which leaves the readers to discern for themselves between what's real and what's only apparent. There's also no positive quest like in the other volumes. Rather, it's a passive reaction to disastrous events. The main character is an adult. So the young children are there to help him, not vice versa. And the total effect of all this is that it puts the reader into a mature, less protected frame of mind frame of reference. There's also the emotional tone of old age, which is accomplished by a list of technical devices as well. Adjectives like last and old and ugly are repeated over and over again. The poem, The Planets, speaks of the last planet, old and ugly. Last, as a word, is telling. The book title itself alerts to the theme of finality. The first sentence of the book is, In the Last Days of Narnia. Chapter 12's keynote sentence of the whole story, in fact, is, And then the last battle of the last king of Narnia began. Old and ugly, Shift the ape is both old and ugly. He was so old that no one could remember when he had first come to live in these parts. And he was the cleverest, ugliest, most wrinkled ape you can imagine. He himself says, I'm so very old, hundreds and hundreds of years old. And it's because I'm so old that I'm so wise. Father Time is obviously old as well. In Lewis's book, Oxford History of English Literature, he says that Father Time, his name was once Saturn. In the silver chair, you remember this dormant gentle giant in the underworld, which is roused or going to be roused at the end of the last battle. Jill and Eustace remembered that his name was 
Father Time, and that he would wake on the day the world ended. Father Time had a snowy beard in the, the uh, silver chair, Saturn with his frosty bird in the poem Turn of the Tide. Most tellingly, an early draft of the silver ch chair reads, that is the god Saturn who once was a king of in Overland. They say he will awake at the end of the world. Finally, Lewis uses Father Time instead of Saturn to hide the planetary theme, according to Ward. It would have been too obvious. Father Time extinguishes the sun by squeezing it in hand like an orange. The poem says, the sun's finger daunted with darkness. And this leads to or he leads to dreary and disastrous dawn. You remember from the discarded image, disastrous events. Literally, disaster means a bad star. Disaster. It also means that de-starring or the unstarring. Let me read from chapter 14, Night Falls on Narnia. Immediately, the sky became full of shooting stars. Even one shooting star is a fine thing to see. But these were dozens, and then scores, and then hundreds, till it was like silver rain, and it went on and on. And when it had gone on for some while, one or two of them began to think that there was another dark shape against the sky, as well as the giants. It was a different place. It was in a different place, right overhead, up in the very roof of the sky, as you might call it. Perhaps it's a cloud, thought Edmund. At any rate, there were no stars there, just blackness. But all around, the downpour of stars went on. And then the starless patch began to grow, spreading further and further out from the center of the sky. And presently, a quarter of the whole sky was black, and then a half. And at last, the rain of shooting stars was going on only low down near the horizon. With a thrill of wonder, and there was some terror in it too, they all suddenly realized what was happening. The spreading blackness was not a cloud at all. It was simply emptiness. The black part of the sky was the part in which there were no stars left. All the stars were falling. Aslan had called them home. There we saw the merging of Father Time with Aslan. Aslan taking on the role of Saturn. The atmosphere of gathering misfortune is conveyed again using a list of technical devices. Um, if only small things had not happened, some larger misfortunes could have been evaded. There are moments of respite followed by new and unrelated agony. The hero's plans are frustrated repeatedly, and there's also plain ignorance about the right course of action. It's cold. The word shivering is used 10 times. Not just the characters, but ice cold air blows through whole Narnia. And worst, from the children's point of view, any child reader would shudder at this. There's the fulfillment of this dire prophecy when Ginger reverts to being a dumb and witless animal. You remember, fair language leaves us. Finally, the death toll spikes. So far in the Chronicles, there's fewer than a dozen deaths. And now Saturn deals death in abundance, as Ward says, bearing all his sons away, as we read in um, the Allegory of Love. 
the verbs to murder, to kill, to die, and other cognate adjectives and nouns appear over 60 times in the book. It is a book about death, largely. It is also the book with the most explicit astrological language. You remember Rune Wit, who had a most telling name, Rune Wit. He says, Never in all my days have I seen such terrible things written in the skies as there have been nightly since this year began. I know by my art that there have not been such disastrous conjunctions of the planets for 500 years. The stars never lie. Turning from imagery to message, from poema to logos, we know that Lewis rejected so-called dark theologies personally, which means he didn't flirt with a ambiguous God who could either be good or evil or somehow beyond both good and evil. He rejected dualism as well. So how could Aslan embody Saturn? How would Lewis deploy Saturn, the father of disaster, of coldness, ugliness, terror, treachery, and death, for Christological purposes? Where is Aslan to begin with? Seemingly, there's no appearance of Aslan until everyone is dead. What is worse is that there are doubts about Aslan's goodness. Aslan apparently approves of hard physical labor. His name is mixed with Tash, Tashlan. He's seemingly very angry with Narnians and he communicates only through the ape and so on. But King Tyrion's desperate thoughts, they're soon cleared. You remember Saturn's influence was not bad per se, depended on the recipient's character. Death is also God's tool, and Narnia is brought to its appointed end by Aslan. Tyrion, according to Ward, receives the Saturnine effect, which is translated into spiritual insight that penetrates these grim, death-like surfaces. And he determines to be faithful despite all this apparent forsakenness. And this is all about the contemplative faculty. You remember in Dante, Saturn's sphere was for contemplatives. According to Ward, Lewis does the same. The last battle is a meditation of this Christological attribute that Lewis spoke most of, which is the divine presence in human suffering and loneliness. The most frequent biblical passage that Lewis quotes is Christ's cry from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which is quoted 19 times across many genres and even twice before Lewis's conversion. Tyrion cries from his tree as well. And he called out, Aslan, Aslan. Aslan, come help us now. But the darkness and the cold and the quietness went on just the same. Let me be killed, cried the king. I ask nothing for myself, but come and save all Narnia. And still there was no change in the night or the wood, but there began to be a kind of change inside Tyrion. Without knowing why, he began to feel a faint hope, and he felt somehow stronger. Tyrion felt abandonment and self-abnegation, 
but it's followed by the awakening of the so-called contemplative faculty, which Ward describes as the perception of spiritual presence despite unchanging external circumstances. This is an exercise of obstinacy in belief. And Tyrion is able to perceive Aslan despite his invisibility. I give myself up to the justice of Aslan, which parallels Christ's faithful contemplation of his father. He could not feel or seal, but, uh, see God, but he addressed God as my God, my God. After death, he's given the divine accolade, well done, last of the kings of Narnia, who held firm in the darkest hour, which echoes, well done, good and faithful servant, from the Gospel of Matthew. MF, the Calamine soldier, is another example of a faithful contemplative. MF in Hebrew means truth or fidelity. And he is a child of Saturn. He's called the seventh son. He's the seventh in descent from King Rillian. And he is an example of an anonymous Christian, someone who worships God without knowing it. He turns out he worshiped Aslan all along. And most interestingly, readers as well, they have to be content with um, not finding Aslan or finding him despite his apparent absence. And so they, in a way, enjoy this contemplativeness if they imaginatively have stepped into the Saturnine atmosphere. As for Aslan's hidden and visible presence, it turns out he's been present all along. Tyrion says, Oh, Aslan, Aslan, he whispered, if you will not come yourself, at least send me the helpers from beyond the world. And that is what happens. Eustace and Jill, the centaur, the wise lamb, and especially the water coming from the white rock. These are divine agents which are perceptible to the contemplative spirit which penetrates the surface impressions. So Aslan is present, even materially, not just spiritually. And here the backdrop is the idea of the church being the body of Christ. Christ, um, peep, the peep, people are the you know, body parts of Christ, and Christ is present through his body. And then Aslan arrives visibly at the very end. And Ward writes of this end that it is skillfully depicted. The most direct theological message would be there are worse things than death, worse things than to die, which is the theme of the essay, The World's Last Night, and also of A Severe Mercy, one of my favorite books on love by Sheldon Van Nocken, Lewis's friend, um, A Standard Wedding Gift, one of the two standard books that I give as a wedding gift. You remember Saturn's drink is either for bane or blessing. As for blessing, Tyrion and the company, they learn um, that it's sweet and fitting to die for the country because everybody has to die. So this is not a bad way to go. It's a severe mercy. And then Bane, the dwarfs, they treat nobility, they treat this patriotic feeling and self-sacrifice with a flippant 
cynicism. They are the mopes and, and malcontents as opposed to contemplatives. And they're modeled on this post-war generation, something we've talked about in earlier lectures, the young, highly educated men who are angry and restless, and they're full of distrust and contempt, uh, the inhabitants of a modern Saturnocentric universe. T.S. Eliot, guided by Don, according to Lewis, is infecting or infected a generation of cynics with chaos instead of fortifying this generation against it. This was Lewis's interpretation. I have heard Eliot being defended as well. Part of Lewis's raison d'être as a writer was to break this hopeless universe. Lewis's cosmos makes room for Saturn, but it's not Saturnocentric. There's space for human grief. Even the heroes in the story, they weep freely and openly. This sorrow or such sorrow is described as Tyrion, in fact, as a virtue. And not to cry over Narnia's death would be a discourtesy. To love is to be vulnerable. Sorrow and heartbreak are not a sign of a failure to love, but one, not the only, but one of love's natural consequences. Because all loves, all earthly loves, and all stories must end. Life and Adventures in Narnia, we read, had only been the cover and the title page. Now they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Ward concludes, it is a paradoxical image with which to finish a story but a paradox which nicely expresses the good fortune that Infortuna Maior may bring to those who respond positively to his influence, binding their beginning, finding their beginning in their end. As new life springs in the story, Saturn ceases to dominate and the center of gravity shifts to its true center. The planets, the poem, says that, it, it, that the, when you reach the rim of the round sky, you arrive at heaven's hermitage, a resting place. Heaven is the true center of Lewis's spiritual cosmos, and heaven is jovial, Jupiter dominates a universe beyond all the spheres, the Empyrean itself, the resurrection home of Aslan. This sort of spiritual spring, uh, a vision of it, can be tasted sometimes on Earth. On a spring morning, for example, winter has passed and night has passed as well. The last quarter of the last battle symbolizes this sort of thing. The first three quarters um, reach Tyrion's death, and thereafter Saturn fades and Jupiter takes over. Father, time is given a new name, which is unspecified in the story. However, Jove is mentioned directly. Isn't it wonderful, said Lucy. Have you noticed one can't feel afraid, even if one wants to? Try it. By Jove, neither one can, said Eustace, after he had tried. Fortuna Maior first mentioned, and we are back in the jovial spirit of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. This is Aslan's second coming. Lewis is sometimes criticized for so-called escapism. How could he defend himself? Well, 
one of the functions of art, not the only function, but one of the functions of art is to meet psychological needs as well. Uh, true art ought to, thought Lewis. It's one of art's justifications. True art properly awakens or strengthens whatever part in us that at the time needs extra support. And one of the parts is imagination that might need extra support. Lewis felt that his contemporaries were spiritually malnourished. They were under the imaginative spell of Saturn. We too easily assume that brain splattered on a wall somehow represent life as it really is. And religious consolations then are just a trick. I'm reminded of Christopher Tolkien who defended his father J.R. Tolkien against a similar charge of escapism. And he said that some people maliciously confound the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. True art ought to meet our topical and also timeless needs. Saturn is not king of Narnia. What is he then? Well, like all the planets, he is Jupiter's servant. By nature, Saturn points to Jupiter. How so? Well, calling something a disaster presupposes faint understanding of aster. And this is the fallacy of every good atheist, as Lewis describes them in his essay De Futilitate. The failure to see that defiance of suffering and criticism of suffering of the supposed idiotic nature of the world is really an unconscious homage to something in or beyond, behind that cosmos, which he recognizes, the good atheist recognizes, as infinitely valuable and authoritative. For if mercy and justice were really only private whims of his own with no objective and impersonal roots, and if he realized this, he could not go on being indignant. The fact that he arraigns heaven itself for disregarding them means that at some level of his mind he knows they are enthroned in a higher heaven still. This is what the atheist C.S. Lewis realized, that he found it difficult to justify his, the shaking of his fist against the universe unless ultimate reality was, is, or would be fundamentally good. And what reason did he have to suppose that it was? In The Problem of Pain, Lewis calls this not the problem of evil, but the problem of goodness. How do you account for our budding sense of goodness as the standard against we judge the world and judge other people's actions? Outrage at crookedness requires a notion of the straight. That notion could never have arisen if everything was crooked. Or if everything is dualistically good and bad, how could we explain our preference of happiness over sadness? Saturn makes his patience into contemplatives who see beyond the sorrow. Bleakness and cynicism are actually caused by naive optimism their twin brother. According to Lewis, a sort of Christian realism avoids both extremes, both naive optimism and cynical pessimism. The world's sighs and woes are chronic, but they're not absolute because Christ's 
resurrection has somehow relativized them, according to Ward. Alleviate suffering insofar as you can, but don't despair over the suffering that remains. In the alliterative meter, you remember the analysis of the poem, The Planets, Lewis writes, of Saturn we know more than enough, but who does not need to be reminded of Jove? The human mind isn't just passive. Actually, it contributes to the construction of one's own evolving worldview. We don't have to give cynicism the privilege. Um, we can choose which images to entertain imaginatively. In Lewis's short essay, which we talked about in a previous lecture, Meditation in a Tool Shed, he admits that we are often deceived by things from the inside. And having been so often deceived by looking along, are we not well advised to trust only to looking at? The last battle answers this, often deceived, yet open once again your heart. The end of the book is an invitation to look along the spirit of wounded open-heartedness. Love is always followed by hurt, and hurt is a subtle double invitation, either to love again, open once again, or not. And hurt could be likened to stinging smoke, suffocating smoke of a dying fire. There are two ways to put that out to get rid of the smoke. One is to either rekindle the flame, the other is to put it out for good. Further in and further up, cried Runewit, and thundered away in a gallop to the west. And though they did not understand him, the words somehow set them tingling all over. In Dante, the pilgrim on the edge of paradise turns around and looks back over the planetary realms he's traveled and Lewis does the same in the Chronicles of Narnia. The reader's attention is directed across the planets in the previous Chronicles. At the end, when summoned are Tumnus from Jupiter, Reepicheep from Mars, the hopping monopods from Sol, Puddleglum from Luna, the twins Cor and Corin from Mercury, and Queen Helen and King Frank from Venus. Here's the septet, the gathering of the saints at the end of the world in Narnia. Did you spot the fallacy? Which one was it? Where was it? <laughs>